How does Glastonbury go from this to this? In the month of June, over 200,000 people descend into the quiet village of Pilton to experience the most iconic music festival in the world. Glastonbury is often described as entering a different country, brimming with its own unique music and culture. Many artists dream to play there, and people rarely leave without making life-changing memories. When the festival is in operation, it's the 28th biggest town or city in the UK in between Bolton and Wolverhampton, so that is a lot of infrastructure which needs to be built. People need feeding, people need water, people need entertainment, and most importantly, people need to go to the toilet. Before we get into how the festival is built today, we must go back to 1970 when Michael Evis created the Pop, Blues and Folk Festival, which was attended by a minuscule 1,500 people. A year later, this evolved into the Glastonbury Fair, which is where the iconic pyramid stage was born. Its first iteration was a one-tenth replica of the Great Pyramid of Giza, and was built from scaffolding and metal sheeting. Fast forward 10 years to the first official Glastonbury festival, and this is when the pyramid stage became a permanent structure. The 80s were an inflection point, attendances were growing, the festival was expanding, and it became a yearly fixture, barring the fallow years. The following 30 years saw Glastonbury get much bigger, bolder and busier each year, which also means a much bigger setup operation. As I mentioned earlier, Glastonbury Festival is essentially bringing a city into a farm, hosting hundreds of thousands of people and then tearing that city down, all whilst doing so as sustainably as possible. Despite it being a year-round planning process, construction gets really busy from the 1st of June as there are over 400 workers trying to assemble the festival before the gates open. Let's break down some of the key areas to see how they do it. For the 2023 iteration of the festival, there were over 100 venues for people to enjoy a wide spectrum of music. All of the smaller bars dotted around the site have their own micro teams to scout and plan their acts months in advance, schedule their slots, build their sound systems and do final checks. Croissant Neuf, however, one of the longest standing stages at Glastonbury, having launched in 1986, doesn't begin construction until the Wednesday before the festival. Organiser Sally Howell says it's like building a mini festival inside a festival and also that it's an all year round job as she's constantly getting emails and is booking people, including a certain Ed Sheeran when he was just 19 years old. Some of the larger stages take a bit longer though. For example, the Icon stage in Block 9 takes three months to build and uses nearly 100 tonnes of building materials. Then of course, you have the iconic Pyramid stage. I previously mentioned the first two iterations, but the one built in 1981 burned down in 1994, which led to the third and final pyramid stage, the one that we all know and love today. This was built in 2000. The metal framework, which is 30 meters high, covers 1600 square meters, weighs 40 tons, and uses four kilometers of steel tubing, is a permanent fixture on Worthy Farm but there is a lot of work that needs to be done before it's festival ready. In May time, an independent team is contracted to put the grey outer skin onto the metal frame. A company called Serious Stages builds the rest. They commence some of their work as early as March. Their role is to build the goalposts which the TV screens are hung from, the inner stage itself, the PA towers, the front of house structure, and also the disabled viewing ramps. In addition to that, Serious Stages build the other stage, West Holtz and the park. In 2015, Glastonbury liaised with Serious Stages to upgrade the other stage. They built a custom design which allowed them to have much more storage space behind the screen compared to the 2014 stage which had the standard goalposts. Because Glastonbury is as committed to reducing greenhouse emissions as it is to providing a great time, the way they power the festival is very important. 
That's why Glastonbury 2023 was run entirely by renewable energy. All production areas were either powered by electricity from fossil fuel free sources or they were run on solar panels and battery hybrid systems. Also, the fuel used to power the generators was made from waste cooking oil. Even Arcadia's giant fire-breathing spider was run entirely off recycled biofuels. The sustainability team also built an anaerobic digester plant, which essentially turns the cattle slurry into biogas, which generates electricity to help power the farm, with the goal eventually being to power more of the festival with that. Glastonbury has aspired towards sustainability since 1984, but in the words of the legend of Emily Evis, we're getting better at it, but it's a long, it's a, you know, it's a long-term mission. As you can imagine, 200,000 people eating and drinking for five days are going to need a lot of toilet facilities. One of the two main options at Glastonbury are nicknamed long drops. These are small pods of toilets where your business literally does a long drop. For 2023, they installed over 2,000 of these across the site. All of the waste then goes through a separate processing plant to remove anything in there such as sanitary towels before the millions of litres are then pumped into the national disposal system. These long drops start getting taken out of storage and dropped on site as early as April. They also have over 1,300 compost toilets on site which turns human waste into compost for crops at the end of the festival. Before the festival kicks off, workers distribute over 12,000 bins across the grounds, which separate rubbish into biodegradable food waste, non-biodegradable waste, and then cans and bottles. The festival goers are then responsible for separating their own rubbish into these bins. Each day, there are volunteer litter pickers cleaning up the grounds as the festival goes on. Then, behind the scenes, Glastonbury has one of the largest temporary recycling centres in England built into a huge barn to help sort out the rubbish. Besides all the big infrastructural things we just discussed, there are thousands of more jobs which need to be executed in the weeks before the festival begins. These include, but are not limited to, setting up the campsite limits, painting and distributing the 2,000 direction signs, setting up food and beverage stalls, and all of the shops. Also, the four metre tall, eight kilometre perimeter fence for the festival itself begins being erected around May time. Despite all of this, Glastonbury is primarily a farm and a festival second. That's why all the sustainability initiatives are in place whilst the festival is on and are fallow every five years to allow for the grass and wildlife to recover. But this leads to my final and most important point. Where do all the cows go? Well, the 1,000 animals from the land are moved to a large shed based away from the action at Worthy Farm. The food is put in front of them, so the organisers described it as it's like them being on an all-inclusive holiday. Evidently, Glastonbury is a collaborative effort involving a dedicated team of organisers, production crews, volunteers and contractors. Their collective expertise and hard work bring the festival to life, creating the magical experience that over 200,000 people will remember for a lifetime. And I can say that with confidence as I attended for the first time myself this year, and it truly is another world. It's just